All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, welcome everyone. We're absolutely delighted that you joined us today for the Mineta Transportation Institute Research SNAPS webinar. I'm Dr. Karen Philbrick, the Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. We are a university transportation center that leads two consortiums, one funded through the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017, more fondly known as California's Senate Bill 1, and the second nationwide consortium competitively selected and funded through the US Department of Transportation. We focus on improving the mobility of people and goods, and we work every day to ensure that we increase mobility for all by improving the safety, efficiency, accessibility, and convenience of our nation's transportation system. During today's webinar, if you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them either into the chat feature or to the Q&A feature. We will have a robust conversation at the end of their presentation. Also wanted to let you know that we will have the slides and a video of today's webinar available shortly on our website and promoted through our social media channels. So today we will learn about research-based evidence that explores transit-oriented development and park and rides, both of which, as you probably all know, have the potential to boost ridership and make our cities more inclusive and more sustainable with an eye for determining today which is appropriate and where. On that note, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's presenters. We have Mr. John Niles and Dr. Mike Pogodinsky. Mr. Niles has been a longtime MTI research associate, and he is also the founder and president of Global Telematics, a policy research consulting firm based in Seattle. At MTI, he has led many studies as a principal investigator, and these have focused on transit-oriented development, urban freight mobility planning, bus rapid transit, and of course, park and ride productivity studies. Joining him is Dr. Mike Pogodinsky, also a longtime MTI research associate and a professor of economics at San Jose State University. Mike's transportation research includes work on the employment impacts of the California high-speed rail system, the impact on ridership of park and ride facilities, and finally, the economics of bike sharing. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to our presenters. John and Mike, please take it away. Thank you very much, Karen. It's a pleasure to uh, be here doing this presentation of our research. Uh, thanks to the Mineta Transportation Institute for uh, supporting this, sponsoring this. Thanks to all the people who, at the transit agencies who provided uh, some data. You know who you are, or if you ask us, we'll tell you who you are. It's, uh, we've been working at this for a couple of years. We're talking today about park and ride. We uh, abbreviated PNR and Transit Oriented Development or TOD. Uh, quick to quickly provide an example here of what it looks like. This is from my hometown of uh, Seattle, uh, Seattle area. This is Redmond, Washington. We're looking here at a combined uh, PNR TOD. And uh, we've got uh, 322 uh, apartments right there. We've got some 377 park and ride spaces. Interestingly, there are even 415 parking spaces underneath the apartment for residents and guests. We've got a bus transit stop there. The, the uh, light rail is coming to town, although it might be in a different location here. We've got a bus staging area and even a skateboard park. All around this is livable, walkable urbanism all around. Uh, it's really a good, a good picture of, of what we're talking about here. And these exist, of course, in uh, San Jose and in Los Angeles as well. These are our, our, our focus for our transit agencies, uh, three of them, uh, for the one for Silicon Valley, San Clara VTA, San Jose, uh, King County is the big county around Seattle, Los Angeles Metro covers uh, all of Los Angeles County. Uh, very, very big there in Los Angeles. Uh, VTA and King County Metro serve roughly equivalent areas. Big differences though in the level of transit boardings. Look at those annual boardings per capita. They, they vary a lot, a lot higher in Seattle drops down a bit for Los Angeles as they gear up on transit, a lot lower in, in Silicon Valley. 
And it shows up in the ratio of PNR use to transit use as well. We're not talking about the biggest part of transit use here. So I want to point out actually some reasons why we're so focused on ridership. We have the unfortunate situation in America, and this is not just the pandemic. All, all we're talking about here is going to be pre-pandemic. Transit ridership is just not growing with population across America. Seattle's been doing a little bit better, but uh, if, as you see these graphs over the past uh, even 20 years, uh, and, and focus on the right-hand side of each of those graphs, it's pretty, pretty flat or even dropping. And this is sort of a, a problem that came even pre-pandemic and with the pandemic, things have fallen off a cliff. Uh, the, the, the mode shares aren't great either in, in any of these three places. Uh, look at that line that's colored red, this, the solo driving mode share across. These, these are work trips. These are the, going to work. Uh, solo driving in the 60, 70 ranges. Notice how uh, it's, it's high even for the lowest category of income there, zero to 25K and then uh, rises up a little bit for other folks and, and remarkably flat all the way from 25 on up. Uh, and the transit use there, quite low, it drops down for uh, uh, people making more money, but it's darn low uh, all across the board. And, and that, that's the, ch the challenge I think we're facing, uh, how well the car works for people and how uh, transit isn't, isn't keeping up. So, we focus on ridership in this in this work, and some previous research made us positive about the park and ride potential. Uh, we did some earlier work that shows that it's very good at putting a lot of people on a bus to save operating costs. When you load up a bus in the suburbs at a park and ride in, in where I live in King County, it works. You 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 get more people on the bus than than traveling through uh, cul-de-sacs trying to pick up people. We've, uh, we, have, we have research that shows that uh, even ahead of our work, which you may have previewed, that in fact, uh, park and ride picks up a lot, of, a lot of people compared to residential land use at transit stations, 5.5 5 to 7 for park and ride, 1 to 1.5 for, uh, for residential land use. And of course, since you don't have to do uh, plumbing and walls, in, in fact, physically, it's easier to do a parking space than an apartment, let's face it. And numerous studies have shown that PNR has a positive benefit to cost ratio, uh, but not so much lately. One of the things that struck us was how, uh, this is a, a look at Google Scholar and just counting how many times these things are mentioned. Transit-oriented development is, is hot. It's, it's growing year by year. From uh, the year 2000, the, the uh, orange line goes up and up. Park and ride was going up and up, but it started to fall off. Park and ride's not quite as popular. And, but some new issues are driving our research in the pandemic. Uh, mobility disadvantage, equity. Uh, and, we're, and there's a lot of cross to uh, affordable housing. And should it be a priority strategy at TOD. So we want to we want to look at that. Is that a way to drive ridership? Uh, many low income workers drive their cars to work. We saw that. Should they be supported with PNR? Uh, they live in the suburbs. And for financial sustainability and political support, how should an agency's strategic emphasis be divided? We're not into the details of how you do park and ride or TOD. We're more into the broad picture of how much to emphasize of each. Uh, is, it's about, is it about real estate revenue gained through TOD development or is it, are we generating uh, boardings uh, for uh, people who have found it's better to live in the suburbs even for reasons of housing cost? So with that, let me turn it over to Mike and uh, you go, Mike. All right, thanks very much, John. and. Uh... Thanks to Karen Philbrick for that introduction and to MTI for organizing the webinar. Uh, I'm briefly going to talk about our methods and results. We employed cross-sectional data, data that relates to each bus stop in each of the three transit systems at the same moment of time, October 2017. We associated morning weekday boardings uh, with each stop and the catchment area around each stop, a quarter mile buffer. 
We also associated estimated economic, demographic, business, and transit-specific variables with the catchment areas. The basic framework for our regression estimates is to model morning weekday boardings as a function of economic, demographic, and business variables within walking distance of a bus stop. We define walking distance as a quarter of a mile. We created these quarter mile buffers around each stop. Within these catchment areas, we estimated the number of housing units, the number of jobs, and the median household income. The data for these estimates came from the US Census Bureau. The housing units and household income data came from the American Community Survey. Uh, the data about jobs came from a data set called zip code business patterns. The basic regression has morning weekday boardings as the dependent variables and variables representing household income, employment, and housing in the catchment area as independent variables. Some transit-specific variables concerning the stop, such as proximity of the stop to a park and ride facility and the number of spaces in the park and ride facility, as well as its distance from the uh, center of the city and whether the stop uh, is a rail stop uh, are also independent variables. Our expectation of the sign and significance of the independent variables are as follows. Income is expected to be strongly negatively associated with boardings. Uh, the poor is the population in the immediate area around a, uh, a stop. Uh, we expect uh, poorer people to be more attracted to public transit. Housing is expected to be strongly positively associated with boardings for obvious reasons. Uh, we have no specific ex expectation for employment uh, as concerns boardings. Uh, it would make sense to have uh, um, uh, to expect uh, employment to be associated uh, with alightings uh, because that's a destination in a morning commute. Uh, light rail is expected to be strongly positively associated with uh, boardings, mostly because rail uh, is going to be sighted along the high volume corridors. And distance to City Hall is expected weekly to be positively associated with boardings. So there's some uh, uh, theory about a suburbanization effect, that suburbanites are more attracted uh, to uh, uh, park and ride. The park and ride variables are expected to exert a positive effect on boardings, but details differ by the specification. Next. We employ, similar method Thank you. we employ similar methodology for all three transit systems, but some differences uh, <clears throat> arose because of differences in data availability. Boardings data, park and ride data, and data about rail versus bus was of different levels of completeness across the transit agencies. Next. Uh, this is an example of a map. Uh, this uh, happens to be VTA and uh, shows the location of uh, bus stops, shows uh, the location and size of uh, PNRs. Uh, it indicates uh, some of the high uh, boarding stops and indicates the location of City Hall. Uh, City Hall was used as a, as a measure of the location of downtown. Next. We employed three specifications of the basic regression equation. These specifications differ in how the park and ride variables were modeled. Specification one employs the interaction between a quarter mile dummy and the size of the nearest park and ride uh, lot to measure the park and ride effect. Uh, dummy variable is a zero one variable. Specification two includes the interaction between the quarter mile dummy variable and the si and size categories. Uh, of park and ride lots. So we can uh, categorize the park and ride lots as being uh, small, medium, or large. And specification three takes into account the size of the nearest park and ride facility and the distance to the nearest park and ride facility to, uh, to measure the park and ride effect. Uh, we employed these uh, alternative specifications basically to test the robustness of our results. Next. Uh, we employed uh, negative binomial regression. This is a regression method in the same family as Poisson regression. Both Poisson and negative binomial regressions are especially suitable for count data, data like boardings. Negative binomial regression is appropriate if the data exhibits what is called over dispersion, if the variance is greater than the mean, uh, which our data and lots of empirical data uh, does exhibit that. Our estimates are presented in two basically equivalent forms. 
as coefficient estimates uh, that have a particular interpretation in the context of uh, Poisson or negative binomial regression uh, called a semi-elasticity interpretation. And there's an alternative way of presenting the same estimates called an incidence rate ratio, IRRs. Uh, these two are related. The coefficient estimates, when exponentiated, are the IRRs. In the semi-elasticity interpretation, the percentage change in expected boardings is equal to the coefficient estimate multiplied by 100, multiplied by the unit change in the independent variable in question. Uh, uh, in the IRR interpretation, the expected change in boardings is inflated by the IRR. If the IRR is larger than one, the expected boardings will be greater by that factor for a unit change in the independent variable. If the IRR is less than one, the expected boardings will be less by that factor for a unit change in the independent variable. To assess, assess statistical significance, we always used robust standard errors. So uh, any asymmetry uh, is accounted for. This is an example uh, of uh, the, one of the econometric results that we have. This is uh, specification two results for VTA. And I'm only going to discuss uh, this specification in detail. The other cases are analogous. Uh, the three model specifications were generally consistent and resulted in similar assessments of the impact of housing and parking spaces. Uh, to look at the income variable here, and I uh, realize you have to have very sharp eyes to appreciate this, uh, but there's a variable called median household income low. Uh, that's uh, income that is at or below the 25th percentile uh, in the sample. And there's a, a variable just below that called median household income high. That is income that is at or above the 75th percentile of income in the sample. And what do we see? We see the coefficient uh, is positive on uh, the uh, low income and negative on the high income. That is consistent with the expectation uh, that uh, lower income people will be more attracted to uh, 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 public transit. Let's jump to the results here, Mike. Uh, this is this is uh, interesting. What they, I think we're serious, but let's look at these results here. Uh, okay. How's that? Uh, okay. Let me uh, let me do that. Uh, so, if we uh, among the ways we uh, we looked at the. Um, uh, yeah. John, if you could uh, just go back one slide for a minute. Uh, here we had uh, we had uh, uh, the park and ride uh, lots categorized by size into small, medium, and large. And one of the things uh, you notice is that the coefficient estimates and the IRRs, uh, the coefficient estimates are all positive. They're strongly statistically significant. The IRRs are also uh, large, uh, three, uh, almost four, and six. Uh, that's the uh, factor by which uh, one would inflate uh, the expected ridership uh, for a small size, medium size, or large size park and ride lot. Uh, if you could go uh, forward the slide, next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, so if you look in percentage terms, uh, <clears throat> what does it do to create a large size park and ride lot? Uh, <clears throat> in the vicinity of a transit stop uh, across the three agencies, uh, creating such a large size park and ride lot has uh, dramatic and large effects, uh, increasing uh, expected ridership by 184% uh, for the VTA system, uh, over 400% uh, for uh, <clears throat> King County Metro, and over 100% for LA. Uh, next slide, John. If you look at, and this is, relies on, uh, on a different specification, uh, what does it uh, do to add uh, 100 parking spaces uh, within a quarter of a mile of an existing park and ride lot? Uh, those 100 spaces are going to increase expected ridership uh, by different amounts in the, in the three cases we studied, by 26% in the case of Santa Clara County, uh, by 44% in the case of King County, and about 9% in the case of Los Angeles County. Next, uh, we can compare that with adding 100 housing units in the vicinity of a uh, stop, and that is also going to increase uh, <clears throat> ridership uh, by certain amounts, but uh, <clears throat> uh, you'll notice that these amounts are, uh, are less than uh, were 
indicated in the previous slide. Uh, so adding 100 housing units within uh, the catchment area of a stop in Santa Clara County increases expected ridership around 11%, likewise in King County, and about 5% in Los Angeles County. Um, all right, John, over to you. So here we have uh, the whole thing laid out. That top line is the one I want to focus you on. Uh, that's comparing the parking impact to the housing impact. Uh, 26 to 11 in San Jose, 9 to 5 in LA, 44 to 11, 4 to 1 in uh, Seattle. Big, big differences there. Uh, we're strong on park and ride, less so in those two California cities. Uh, let me show you that, uh, focus on LA just for a second. They have uh, a big difference there between their, their level of park and ride uses. 73% uh, of their space is filled, but only 1% uh, of, their, of their usage uh, comes to, uh, shows up on parking in uh, transit ridership. And in San Jose, uh, focus on pretty low transit ridership per capita. But interestingly enough, uh, a lot of park and ride, uh, apparently unused, uh, as shown in the, in the numbers we've circled there. Um, I think we're ready for some uh, questions now. So let me, uh, we'll put this up in just a second when we get into discussion a little bit more, but I think right now it's time to uh, point out that we're open to uh, follow up at any time and I'll turn yes. it back to uh, Karen now to lead us through the questions. Thank you so much, John. And for those of you who have more than 30 minutes today, our presenters have graciously agreed to remain online to answer any questions that were not adequately addressed. And I see we only have eight minutes left today, so please feel free to stay to stay online. So first off, gentlemen, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of questions posed in our chat feature. First of all, um, one of our participants noted that transit service seems to have been omitted from the regression analysis, but it may be the most important independent variable. And this person went on to say that the relatively large constant in the regression analysis may imply left out variables. Let's start with that and get your feedback, please. Um, I think uh, I'll start by saying I agree with that uh, and promoting further research is what we want to do. Uh, Mike, do you want to comment on that? I think, I think it's a good comment. Yes, I, I, I agree that uh, there are uh, many variables we would have wanted to include in the analysis that uh, uh, we didn't have access to. Uh, so we don't know, uh, in particular, the characteristics of the riders either, and there are uh, lots of characteristics of the transit systems that, uh, that we would uh, have wanted to include. Good question. Okay. And this other person, toward the beginning of your presentation, John, in the beginning, you put up a table, and they wanted to confirm whether mode share is countywide in that particular PowerPoint slide. Yes, that, that in fact would be uh, the whole uh, metro, even the whole metro area, I believe. I believe we, we got into the larger metro area. It wasn't just the transit agencies in, the, in that particular case. So that's a, that's a broad view. Of course, the, the, the metro areas are dominated by the central counties. Uh, and, and when I talk about San Jose, I'm not including the whole Bay Area. That was, that was just what counts for the area of, of uh, Santa Clara County. Okay. Um, a couple of other, one comment followed by a question. Uh, one of our viewers pointed out uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey, which has parking decks and mis mixed use developments near its train station. They also noted that they demolished a parking deck across the street from that station in favor of these, these decks and the mixed use environment, if you will. This person later on in the presentation asked this question. So should park and rides and transit oriented development be built with each other? Because that's the takeaway message this individual is, is hearing. No, I, 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 would, I wouldn't jump to that necessarily. Um, I, I think in some environments we showed right at the beginning in a pretty uh, nice suburban environment and maybe that environment in New Jersey mixing together may make sense. I think it makes 
a lot less sense further out. Uh, I think it's something to to look at, but I don't I don't think it's necessarily the right thing to do. We can we could bring that bring that up as a as a further discussion point. Okay. Um, another question: Were you at all concerned by recent trends assessing a higher risk of parking demand dropping? and facilities becoming obsolete before their useful life. Well, I think we've I think we've seen that to some degree and I think that it needs to be monitored. One thing I would point out is that the uh, you know counting license plates once a year is a pretty not a very good way to keep track of what's going on and I think trends need to be spotted earlier and I I have to tell you there are technologies now available for real-time monitoring in effect, or let's say weekly monitoring of what the usage is and where people are coming from. So I think better data would allow that kind of, of, of uh, phenomenon to be anticipated and dealt with. And I think that's important. I mean, I think managing, uh, managing parking actively is, is very, very important. Understood. Um, one other person suggested that the cost of the park and ride is a variable as well as the daily capacity of the park and ride lot. Were those looked at? We were working with capacity for sure. We were working with capacity more than, uh, more than in fact, we were working exclusively with capacity. We just don't, didn't have good data for that same period for what the uh, usage of the park and ride lot is. So we were dealing more with capacity for sure. Uh, what was the other one, Karen? Um, uh, that one was the cost of park and ride. And, then, no, and, and we didn't have, we didn't have good data on what whether it was free or or caught or I think he's talking about the fee. So we didn't have good data on that. So again, that's that's in that big constant covering some other variables for sure. Uh, and, it, it, and it varies. Okay, Understood. we didn't we, we, we didn't cover everything, and uh, I hope this stimulates more. Taking park and ride seriously, given what we did find is where we're really trying to drive this as much as anything else. We, it's not being paid attention to, Karen. That's what we're, that's what we're thinking. There, there, there are people in every area who care a lot about it. No, no question about it. And it exists. And it's very popular in some places. But I'm saying overall, okay. we, do, we don't see, we, we need a strategic focus. That's Understood. And that leads us to a question that was submitted at the time of registration, which is, are other states or countries successfully relying on transit-oriented development to help combat climate change? Well, there's a, that's a loaded question. Uh, uh, one of the things that concerns me about TOD, of course, is the scale. I mean, the Climate change is a is a worldwide gigantic problem, and looking at this table here that I have in front of you now, clearly limiting VMT, uh, establishing walkable ur urbanism is an adopted strategy. It's an adopted strategy in both California and Washington State. Uh, and by the way, it's it is going on around the world in Europe, for sure. Uh, we have examples. But whether it's how effective it is, is another question that's, you know, in some ways beyond the scope of our research. And all we wanted, we want to say that there's a lot of suburbanization going on and you've got a lot of people driving cars and we're looking, isn't, isn't, isn't park and ride a way to get people on transit? That's what we're, that's what we're thinking. And getting people on transit is part of this, is part of the climate strategy as well. It's one of the tools in the toolbox for those who reside in a more suburban area to be able to bridge that connection with the first and last mile, which in this case is, is much greater than a mile, is, is what it seems to be. That's correct. Thank, so thank you for that. You're very welcome. And with that time, with that last statement, our time together has come to a close. I'd like to thank John and Mike for being with us this morning and remind all of you that we're going to stop the recording now but John and Mike will remain online should you have additional questions. 
So I want to thank you again and remind you about an upcoming research snap. And this one is called Digital Butts and Seats, Creating Interesting, Engaging Virtual Events. So tune in if you need some tips about how to shine on camera, how to deliver a compelling speech, and how to combat Zoom fatigue, which is a very real thing. That will be on March 18th, and we hope to see you then. For those of you who have to disconnect, have a terrific day and contact us at any time with additional questions. Thank you. Thank you.